News at Noon starts right now. The House Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol is holding another hearing today. It's expected to start shortly, and we will bring you that live when it begins. But in the meantime, weather on everybody's minds these days. There is a possibility we may not set a record today, Justin. I think that is possible. Uh, yesterday was 107 records all over the place. OK, I think today's going to be a little bit cooler because we've had some clouds this morning, even a few showers too. Some folks did get some downpours earlier. You see the satellite and radar right there, and uh, we're still looking at some activity that's working uh, east to west across the area. In fact, a lot of this is moving south and west. But you see a few showers here in Bandera County. We've seen a little bit of activity in Medina County down towards Rio County and then a few showers moving out of Southern Bear County. Clouds are trying to clear out though at this point. And as we look a little closer at the cloud cover here, still mostly cloudy at the airport, but seeing more sun. The more sun we see, obviously the warmer temperatures will go and we'll start to see temperatures shoot up a little bit quicker than what we've been dealing with over the last couple of hours. 92 here in San Antonio right now, 92 in Boulevard, 89 Kingdom Lake, 97 in New Braunfels. And we're expecting to be up around 103 today. Now, if these clouds stick around a little bit longer, we maybe can lower these temperatures some, which would be fantastic. Uh, here's a quick look at the forecast. It does call for a few more showers and storms to fire later today across the hill country. Some of these can make their way into the San Antonio area by the evening hours before everything dies down. So we're looking at about a 20% chance of rain today, 103, 104 tomorrow, still hot, small chance of rain, 20% chance Thursday, small chance of rain, still more triple digits going into the weekend. And maybe David, a little bit of a pattern change by early next week, which could bring some quote unquote cooler temperatures and maybe another shot at some showers and storms. Well, we're big fans of pattern changes then. Me too. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. As temperatures remain high, many may be wondering if the Texas power grid can handle the strain. So far, ERCOT has said they are not expecting any wide power outages like we saw in the winter of 2021. That is good news. So now let's take you to that House committee hearing on the January 6th attack on the Capitol is just getting started there live in Washington. The select committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol will be in order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare the committee in recess at any point. Pursuant to House Deposition Authority Regulation 10, the chair announces the committee's approval to release the deposition material presented during today's hearing. Good afternoon. When I think about the most basic way to explain the importance of elections in the United States, there's a phrase that always comes to mind. It may sound straightforward, but it's meaningful. We settle our differences at the ballot box. Sometimes my choice prevails, sometimes yours does, but it's that simple. We cast our votes, we count the votes, if something seems off with the results, we can challenge them in court, and then we accept the results. When you're on the losing side, that doesn't mean you have to be happy about it. And in the United States, there's plenty you can do and say so. You can protest. You can organize. You can get ready for the next election to try to make sure your side has a better chance the next time the people sell their differences at the ballot box. But you can't turn violent. You can't try to achieve your desired outcome through force or harassment or intimidation. Any real leader who sees their supporters going down that path, approaching that line, has a responsibility to say, stop. We gave it our best. We came up short. We try again next time because we settle our differences at the ballot box. On December 14th, 2020, the presidential election was officially over. The Electoral College had cast its vote. Joe Biden was the president-elect of the United States. By that point, many of Donald Trump's supporters were already convinced that the election had been stolen because that's what Donald Trump had been telling them. So what Donald Trump was required to do in that moment, what would have been required of any American leader was to say, we did our best and we came up short. 
He went the opposite way. He seized on the anger he had already stoked among his most loyal supporters, and as they approached the line, he didn't wave them off, he urged them on. Today, the committee will explain how, as a part of his last ditch effort to overturn the election and block the transfer of power, Donald Trump summoned a mob to Washington, D.C and ultimately spurred that mob to wage a violent attack on our democracy. Our colleagues, Ms. Murphy of Florida and Mr. Raskin of Maryland, will lay out this story. First, I'm pleased to recognize our distinguished vice chair, Ms. Cheney of Wyoming, for any opening comments she'd care to offer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Our committee did not conduct a hearing last week but we did conduct an on-the-record interview of President Trump's former White House counsel, Pat Cipollone. If you have watched these hearings, you've heard us call for Mr. Cipollone to come forward to testify. He did, and Mr. Cipollone's testimony met our expectations. We will save for our next hearing President Trump's behavior during the violence of January 6th. Today's hearing will take us from December 14th, 2020, when the Electoral College met and certified the results of the 2020 presidential election up through the morning of January 6th. You will see certain segments of Pat Cipollone's testimony today. We will also see today how President Trump summoned a mob to Washington and how the president's stolen election lies provoked that mob to attack the Capitol. And we will hear from a man who was induced by President Trump's lies to come to Washington and join the mob and how that decision has changed his life. Today's hearing is our seventh. We have covered significant ground over the past several weeks, and we have also seen a change in how witnesses and lawyers in the Trump orbit approach this committee. Initially, their strategy in some cases appeared to be to deny and delay. Today, there appears to be a general recognition that the committee has established key facts including that virtually everyone close to President Trump, his Justice Department officials, his White House advisors, his White House counsel, his campaign, all told him the 2020 election was not stolen. This appears to have changed the strategy for defending Donald Trump. Now the argument seems to be that President Trump was manipulated by others outside the administration that he was persuaded to ignore his closest advisors, and that he was incapable of telling right from wrong. This new strategy is to try to blame only John Eastman, or Sidney Powell, or Congressman Scott Perry, or others, and not President Trump. In this version, the president was, quote, poorly served by these outside advisors. The strategy is to blame people his advisors called, quote, the crazies for what Donald Trump did. This, of course, is nonsense. President Trump is a 76-year-old man. He is not an impressionable child. Just like everyone else in our country, he is responsible for his own actions and his own choices. As our investigation has shown, Donald Trump had access to more detailed and specific information showing that the election was not actually stolen than almost any other American. And he was told this over and over again. No rational or sane man in his position could disregard that information and reach the opposite conclusion. And Donald Trump cannot escape responsibility by being willfully blind nor can any argument of any kind excuse President Trump's behavior during the violent attack on January 6th. As you watch our hearing today, I would urge you to keep your eye on two specific points. First, you will see evidence that Trump's legal team, led by Rudy Giuliani, knew that they lacked actual evidence of widespread fraud sufficient to prove that the election was actually stolen. They knew it but they went ahead with January 6th anyway. And second, consider how millions of Americans were persuaded to believe what Donald Trump's closest advisors in his administration did not. 
These Americans did not have access to the truth like Donald Trump did. They put their faith and their trust in Donald Trump. They wanted to believe in him. They wanted to fight for their country, and he deceived them. For millions of Americans, that may be painful to accept, but it is true. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Without objection, the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Murphy, and the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin, for opening statements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that then-President Donald Trump lost in a free and fair election. And yet, President Trump insisted that his loss was due to fraud in the election process, rather than to the democratic will of the voters. The president continued to make this claim despite being told again and again by the courts, by the Justice Department, by his campaign officials, and by some of his closest advisors that the evidence did not support this assertion. This was the big lie, and millions of Americans were deceived by it. Too many of our fellow citizens still believe it to this day. It's corrosive to our country and damaging to our democracy. As our committee has shown in prior hearings, following the election, President Trump relentlessly pursued multiple interlocking lines of effort, all with a single goal, to remain in power despite having lost. The lines of effort were aimed at his loyal Vice President, Mike Pence, at state election and elected officials, and at the U.S. Department of Justice. The President pressured the Vice President to obstruct the process to certify the election result. He demanded that state officials find him enough votes to overturn the election outcome in that state, and he pressed the Department of Justice to find widespread evidence of fraud. When justice officials told the president that such evidence did not exist, the president urged them to simply declare that the election was corrupt. On December 14th, the Electoral College met to officially confirm that Joe Biden would be the next president. The evidence shows that once this occurred, President Trump and those who were willing to aid and abet him turned their attention to the joint session of Congress scheduled for January 6th, at which the vice president would preside. In their warped view, this ceremonial event was the next, and perhaps the last, inflection point that could be used to reverse the outcome of the election before Mr. Biden's inauguration. As President Trump put it, the Vice President and enough members of Congress simply needed to summon the courage to act. To help them find that courage, the President called for backup. Early in the morning of December 19th, the President sent out a tweet urging his followers to travel to Washington, D.C. for January 6th. Be there. We'll be wild, the President wrote. As my colleague, Mr. Raskin, will describe in detail, this tweet served as a call to action and in some cases as a call to arms for many of President Trump's most loyal supporters. It's clear the President intended the assembled crowd on the January 6th to serve his goal. And as you've already seen, and as you will see again today, some of those who were coming had specific plans. The President's goal was to stay in power for a second term despite losing the election. The assembled crowd was one of the tools to achieve that goal. And in today's hearing, we will focus on events that took place in the final weeks leading up to January 6th, starting in mid-December. And we'll add color and context to evidence you've already heard about, and we'll also provide additional new evidence. For example, you'll hear about meetings in which the President entertained extreme measures designed to help him stay in power, like the seizure of voting machines. We will show some of the coordination that occurred between the White House and members of Congress as it relates to January 6. And some of these members of Congress would later seek pardons. We will also examine some of the planning for the January 6 protests, placing special emphasis on one rally planner's concerns about the potential violence. And we will describe some of the President's key actions on the evening of January 5th and the morning of January 6, including how the President edited and ad-libbed his speech that morning at the Ellipse, directed the crowd to march to the Capitol, and spoke off script in a way that further inflamed an already angry crowd. I yield to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Ms. Murphy, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair. Four days after the electors met across the country and made Joe Biden 
the president-elect. Donald Trump was still trying to find a way to hang on to the presidency. On Friday, December 18th, his team of outside advisors paid him a surprise visit in the White House that would quickly become the stuff of legend. The meeting has been called unhinged, not normal, in the craziest meeting of the Trump presidency. The outside lawyers who'd been involved in dozens of failed lawsuits had lots of theories supporting the big lie, but no evidence to support it. As we will see, however, they brought to the White House a draft executive order that they had prepared for President Trump to further his ends. Specifically, they proposed the immediate mass seizure of state election machines by the U.S. military. The meeting ended after midnight with apparent rejection of that idea. In the wee hours of December 19th, dissatisfied with his options, Donald Trump decided to call for a large and wild crowd on Wednesday, January 6th, the day when Congress would meet to certify the electoral votes. Never before in American history had a president called for a crowd to come contest the counting of electoral votes by Congress or engaged in any effort designed to influence, delay, or obstruct the joint session of Congress in doing its work required by our Constitution and the Electoral Count Act. As we'll see, Donald Trump's 1.42 a.m. tweet electrified and galvanized his supporters, especially the dangerous extremists and the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, and other racist and white nationalist groups spoiling for a fight against the government. Three rings of interwoven attack were now operating towards January 6th. On the inside ring, Trump continued trying to work to overturn the election by getting Mike Pence to abandon his oath of office as vice president and assert the unilateral power to reject electoral votes. This would have been a fundamental and unprecedented breach of the Constitution that would promise Trump multiple ways of staying in office. Meanwhile, in the middle ring, members of domestic violent extremist groups created an alliance, both online and in person, to coordinate a massive effort to storm, invade, and occupy the Capitol. By placing a target on the joint session of Congress, Trump had mobilized these groups around a common goal, emboldening them, strengthening their working relationships, and helping build their numbers. Finally, in the outer ring, on January 6th, there assembled a large and angry crowd, the political force that Trump considered both the touchstone and the measure of his political power. Here were thousands of enraged Trump followers, thoroughly convinced by the big lie, who traveled from across the country to join Trump's wild rally to stop the steal. With the proper incitement by political leaders and the proper instigation from the extremists, many members of this crowd could be led to storm the Capitol, confront the vice president in Congress, and try to overturn the 2020 election result. All of these efforts would converge and explode on January the 6th. Mr. Chairman, as you know better than any other member of this committee from the wrenching struggle for voting rights in your beloved Mississippi, the problem of politicians whipping up mob violence to destroy fair elections is the oldest domestic enemy of constitutional democracy in America. Abraham Lincoln knew it too. In 1837, a racist mob in Alton, Illinois, broke into the offices of an abolitionist newspaper and killed its editor, Elijah Lovejoy. Lincoln wrote a speech in which he said that no transatlantic military giant could ever crush us as a nation, even with all of the fortunes in the world. But if downfall ever comes to America, he said, we ourselves would be its author and finisher. If racist mobs are encouraged by politicians to rampage and terrorize, Lincoln said, they will violate the rights of other citizens and quickly destroy the bonds of social trust necessary for democracy to work. Mobs and demagogues will put us on a path to political tyranny, Lincoln said. As we'll see today, this very old problem has returned with new ferocity today as a president who lost an election deployed a mob which included dangerous extremists to attack the constitutional system of election and the peaceful transfer of power. And as we'll see, the creation of the internet and social media has given today's tyrants tools of propaganda and disinformation that yesterday's despots could only have dreamed of. I yield back to the gentle lady from Florida, Ms. Murphy. 
Article II of the United States Constitution establishes the Electoral College. Each state's laws provide that electors are to be chosen by a popular vote. And on December 14th, 2020, electors met in all 50 states and the District of Columbia to cast their votes. Joseph Biden won by a margin of 306 to 232. The election was over. Mr. Biden was the president-elect. Before the Electoral College met, Donald Trump and his allies filed dozens of legal challenges to the election, but they lost over and over again, including in front of multiple judges President Trump had nominated to the bench. In many of these cases, the judges were highly critical of the arguments put forward, explaining that no genuine evidence of widespread fraud had been presented. For example, a federal judge in Pennsylvania said, this court has been presented with strained legal arguments without merit and speculative accusations unsupported by evidence. In the United States of America, this cannot justify the disenfranchisement of a single voter, let alone all the voters of its six most populated state. On December 15th, after the Electoral College certified the outcome, the ma Republican majority leader in the Senate acknowledged Mr. Biden's victory. Yesterday, electors met in all 50 states. So as of this morning, our country has officially a president-elect and a vice president-elect. Many millions of us had hoped the presidential election would yield a different result. But our system of government has processes to determine who will be sworn in on January the 20th. The Electoral College has spoken. So today I want to congratulate President-elect Joe Biden. Even members of President Trump's cabinet and his White House staff understood the significance of his losses in the courts and the absence of evidence of fraud. They also respected the constitutional certification by the Electoral College. Many of them told President Trump that it was time to concede the election to Mr. Biden. For example, then Secretary of Labor, Gene Scalia, an accomplished lawyer and the son of late Justice Scalia, called President Trump in mid-December and advised him to concede and accept the rulings of the courts. And so I had to put a call into the president. I might have called on the 13th. We spoke, I believe, on the 14th in which um, I conveyed to him that I uh, thought that it was time for him to acknowledge that uh, President Biden had uh, prevailed in the election. But I communicated to the president that uh, when that legal process is exhausted and when the electors are, have voted, that that's the point at which that outcome needs to be expected. I told him that I did believe, yes, that once the, those legal processes were run, uh, if fraud had not been established, that had affected the outcome of the election, then unfortunately, I believe that what had to be done was concede the outcome. As you've seen in prior hearings, President Trump's Justice Department, his White House staff, and his campaign officials were repeatedly telling him that there was no evidence of fraud sufficient to change the outcome of the election. And last week, we conducted an eight-hour interview with President Trump's White House counsel, Pat Cipollone. You'll see a number of excerpts of that interview today and even more in our next hearing. Mr. Cipollone told us that he agreed with the testimony that there was no evidence of fraud sufficient to overturn the election. I want to start by asking if you agree, Mr. Cipollone, with the conclusions of Matt Morgan and Bill Barr, of all of the individuals who evaluate those claims that there is no evidence of election fraud sufficient to undermine the outcome in a particular state. Yes, I agree with that. And Mr. Cipollone also specifically testified that he believed that Donald Trump should have conceded the election. Did you believe, that, and that Mr. Cipollone, that the president should concede once you made the determination based on the investigations that you credited, DOJ did, and the campaign did? Did you, in your mind, form a belief that the president should concede the election loss uh, at a certain point after the election? Well, again, uh, I was the White House counsel. Some of those decisions are political. So to the extent that, but, but if your question is that I believe he should concede the election at a point in time, yes, I did. I, I believe 
um, Leader McConnell went onto the floor of the Senate, I believe, in mid-December, and basically said, you know, the process is done. You know, that, that would be in line with my thinking on these things. As Attorney General Bill Barr testified, December 14th should have been the end of the matter. December 14th was the day that the state certified their votes and sent them to Congress. And in my view, that was the end of the matter. Uh, I didn't see, uh, you know, I, I thought that uh, this would lead inexorably to a new administration. Mr. Cipollone also testified that the president's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, said he shared this view. Yeah. As early as that November 23rd meeting, we understand that there was discussion about the president possibly conceding the election. And, and specifically, uh, we understand that, that Mark Meadows assured both you and Attorney General Barr that the president would eventually agree to a graceful exit. Do you remember Mr. Meadows making any such representation? Are you saying as part of that meeting or separately? Again, without, without getting into that meeting, I would say that that is, a, that is a statement and a sentiment that I heard from Mark Meadows. I see. And, and again, do you know if it was on November 23rd or some point? Again, I, I, it was probably, you know, around that time, yeah. and it was probably subsequent to that time. It wasn't a one-time statement. Mr. Meadows has refused to testify, and the committee is in litigation with him. But many other White House officials shared the view that once the litigation ended and the Electoral College met, the election was over. And here's President Trump's former press secretary. I wanted to clarify, uh, Ms. McEnany, so back to my previous question, it was your view then, or was it your view, that the efforts to overturn the election should have stopped once the litigation was complete? In my view, um, upon the conclusion of litigation uh, was when I, I began to plan for life after the administration. And this is what Ivanka Trump told us. December 14th was the day on which the Electoral College met when these electors around the country met and cast the electoral votes consistent with the, the, the popular vote in each state. And, and it was obviously a, a public proceeding or, or a series of proceedings that President Biden had obtained the requisite number of electors. Was that an important day for you? Did that affect sort of your, your planning or your realization as to whether or not there was going to be an end of, of this administration? I think so. I think it was my, my sentiment probably prior as well. Judd Deere was a White House deputy press secretary. This was his testimony about what he told President Trump. I told him that my personal viewpoint was that the Electoral College had met, uh, which is the uh, <clears throat> system that our uh, country is, is set under to elect a president and vice president. And I believed at that point that the um, means for him to pursue uh, litigation um, uh, was probably closed. And you recall what his response, if any, was? He disagreed. We've also seen this testimony from Attorney General Barr reflecting a view of the White House staff in late November 2020. And then at that point, I left. And as I walked out of the Oval Office, Jared was there with Dan Scavino, who ran his, who ran the president's um, social media, and who I thought was a reasonable guy and believe is a reasonable guy. And I said, uh, how, long is, how long is he going to carry on with this uh, stolen election stuff? Where is this going to go? And by that time, uh, Meadows had caught up with me and uh, leaving the office and caught up to me and, and said uh, that, uh, uh, he said, look, I, I, I think uh, that he's becoming more realistic and knows that there's a limit to how far he can take this. And then Jared said, you know, yeah, we're working on this. We're working on it. 
Likewise, in this testimony, Cassidy Hutchinson, an aide to Mark Meadows, described her conversations with President Trump's Director of National Intelligence, John Ratcliffe, a former Republican congressman. He had expressed to me that he was concerned that it could spiral out of control and potentially be dangerous, either for our democracy or the way that things were going for the sex. Of course, underlying all of this is the fundamental principle that the President of the United States cannot simply disregard the rulings of state and federal courts, which are empowered to address specific election-related claims. The President cannot simply pretend that the courts had not ruled. By that time, uh, the President or his associates had brought, had lost 60 out of 61 cases uh, uh, that they had brought to challenge uh, different aspects of uh, the election in, in a number of states. They lost 60 out of 61 of those cases. Um, so by the time we get to January 3rd, that, that's, that's been clear. Um, I assume, Pat, that you would agree the president is, is uh, obligated to abide by the rulings of the courts. Of course. And, and I assume you also... Everybody, would, everybody is obligated to abide by rules, of course. And, and I assume you also would agree the president has a particular obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That is one of the president's obligations, correct. Yet President Trump disregarded these court rulings and the counsel from his closest advisors and continued his efforts to cling to power. In our prior hearings, you have heard considerable testimony about President Trump's attempts to corruptly pressure Vice President Pence to refuse to count elector electoral votes, to corrupt the Department of Justice, to pressure state officials and state legislatures, and to create and submit a series of fake electoral slates. Now, we will show you what other actions President Trump was taking between December 14th, 2020 and January 6th. I yield to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Throughout our hearings, you've heard how President Trump made baseless claims that voting machines were being manipulated by foreign powers in the 2020 election. You've also heard Trump's Attorney General, Bill Barr, describe such claims as complete nonsense, which he told the President. Let's review that testimony. I saw absolutely zero basis for the allegations, but they were made in such a sensational way that they obviously were influencing a lot of people, uh, members of the public, that there was this systemic corruption in the system and that their votes didn't count and that these machines controlled by somebody else were actually determining it, which was complete nonsense. And it was being laid out there. And I told them that it was, that it was uh, crazy stuff and they were wasting their time on that. And uh, it was doing a great, grave disservice to the country. We've learned that President Trump's White House counsel agreed with the Department of Justice about this. Attorney General Barr made a public announcement on December 1st, less than a month after that he had seen no suspended fraud, sufficient to fair to say that by December 1st, you had reached the same conclusion. It's fair to say that I agree with Attorney General Barr. But Attorney General Barr's conclusion on December 1st, um, yes, I did, and I supported that conclusion. However, the strong rejection of the Attorney General and the White House counsel of these claims did not stop the President from trying to press them in public. But that's not all he did. Indeed, as you'll see in this clip, the President asked Attorney General Bill Barr to have the Department of Justice seize voting machines in the states. My recollection is the President said something like, uh, well, we could get to the bottom, you know, some people say we could get to the bottom of this if, if the Department sees the machines. It was a typical way of raising a point. And I said, absolutely not. There's no probable cause, and I'm not going to seize any machines. And that was that. Yeah. But this wasn't the end of the matter. On the evening of December 18th, 2020, Sidney Powell, General Michael Flynn, and others entered the White House for an unplanned meeting with the president, the meeting that would last multiple hours and become hot-blooded and contentious. 
The executive order behind me on the screen was drafted on December the 16th, just two days after the Electoral College vote, by several of the president's outside advisors over a luncheon at the Trump International Hotel. As you can see here, this proposed order directs the Secretary of Defense to seize voting machines, quote, effective immediately, but it goes even further than that. Under the order, President Trump would appoint a special counsel with the power to seize machines and then charge people with crimes with all resources necessary to carry out her duties. The specific plan was to name Sidney Powell as special counsel, the Trump lawyer who had spent the post-election period making outlandish claims about Venezuelan and Chinese interference in the election, among others. Here's what White House counsel Pat Cipollone had to say about Sidney Powell's qualifications to take on such expansive authority. I don't think Sidney, Sidney Powell would say that I thought it was a good idea to appoint her special counsel. I was vehemently opposed. I didn't think she should have been appointed to anything. Sidney Powell told the president that these steps were justified because of her evidence of foreign interference in the 2020 election. However, as we've seen, Trump's allies had no such evidence and, of course, no legal authority for the federal government to seize state voting machines. Here's Mr. Cipollone again denouncing Sidney Powell's terrible idea. There was a real question in my mind and a real concern, you know, particularly after the attorney general had reached a conclusion that there wasn't sufficient election fraud to change the outcome of the election. When other people kept suggesting that there was, the answer is, what is it? And at some point, you have to put up or shut up. That was my view. Why was this, on a broader scale, a bad idea for the country? To have the federal government seize voting machines? It's a terrible idea for the country. That's not how we do things in the United States. There's no legal authority to do that. And there is a way to contest elections, you know, that, that happens all the time. But the idea that the federal government could come in and seize election machines, you know, that, that's, I don't, I don't understand why we even have to tell you why that's a bad idea. It's a terrible idea. For all of its absurdity, the December 18th meeting was critically important because President Trump got to watch up close for several hours as his White House counsel and other White House lawyers destroyed the baseless factual claims and ridiculous legal arguments being offered by Sidney Powell, Mike Flynn, and others. President Trump now knew all these claims were nonsense not just from his able White House lawyers, but also from his own Department of Justice officials and indeed his own campaign officials. As White House counsel Pat Cipollone told us. With respect to the whole election fraud issue, it, to me it's sort of if you're gonna make those kind of claims and people were open to them early on because people were making all sorts of claims and the real question is, show the evidence, okay? It wasn't just the Justice Department, the Trump campaign, and the Trump White House lawyers who knew it. Even Rudy Giuliani's own legal team admitted that they did not have any real evidence of fraud sufficient to change the election result. Here's an email from Rudy Giuliani's lead investigator, Bernie Carrick, on December 28, 2020, to Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. Mr. Carrick did not mince any words. We can do all the investigations we want later, but if the president plans on winning, it's the legislators that have to be moved, and this will do just that. Mr. Carrick wanted the president to win. What he didn't say in this email was what he would later tell the select committee in a letter that his lawyer wrote to us in November. The letter said, quote, it was impossible for Mr. Carrick and his team to determine conclusively whether there was widespread fraud or whether that widespread fraud would have altered the outcome of the election. In other words, even Rudy Giuliani's own legal team knew before January 6th that they hadn't collected enough actual evidence to support any of their stolen election claims. 
Here's what Trump campaign senior advisor Jason Miller told the committee about some of the so-called evidence of fraud that the campaign had seen from the Giuliani team. So do you know what the examples of fraud numbers, names, and supporting evidence was that you sent to Mo Brooks's office? And when I say you, I mean you or the campaign. There are some very, very general uh, documents as far as um, uh, as far as, uh, say, for example, here are the handful of dead people in several different states. Um, here are uh, explanations on a couple of the legal challenges as far as the, saying that the, um, the rules were changed in an unconstitutional manner. Uh, but it was to say that it was thin uh, is, is probably an understatement. Here's how President Trump's deputy campaign manager described the evidence of fraud that the campaign had seen. You never came to uh, learn or understand that Mayor Giuliani had uh, had produced evidence of election fraud. Is that fair? That's fair. And here's testimony that we received from the Speaker of the Arizona House of Representatives, Rusty Bowers, about an exchange that he had with Rudy Giuliani after the election. At some point, did uh, one of them uh, make a comment that uh, they didn't have evidence, but they had a lot of theories? That was Mr. Giuliani. Chief of Staff Mark Meadows told people that he thought Trump should concede around the time the Electoral College certified the result. But nonetheless, he later worked to try to facilitate President Trump's wishes. Here's what Cassidy Hutchinson told us. During this period, he, um, I perceived his goal with all of this to keep Trump in office. Um, you know, he had very seriously and deeply considered the allegations of voter fraud. But when he began acknowledging that maybe there wasn't enough voter fraud to overturn the election, you know, I, I witnessed him start to explore potential constitutional loopholes more extensively, which I then connected with John Eastman's theories. The startling conclusion is this. Even an agreed upon complete lack of evidence could not stop President Trump, Mark Meadows and their allies from trying to overturn the results of a free and fair election. So let's return to that meeting at the White House on the evening of December 18. That night, a group showed up at the White House, including Sidney Powell, retired Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, and former Overstock.com CEO Patrick Byrne. After gaining access to the building from a junior White House staffer, the group made their way to the Oval Office. They were able to speak with the president by himself for some time until White House officials learned of the meeting. What ensued was a heated and profane clash between this group and President Trump's White House advisors who traded personal insults, accusations of disloyalty to the president, and even challenges to physically fight. The meeting would last over six hours, beginning here in the Oval Office, moving around the West Wing, and many hours later, ending up in the president's private residence. The select committee has spoken with six of the participants, as well as staffers who could hear the screaming from outside the Oval Office. What took place next is best told in their own words, as you will see from this video. Did you believe that it was going to work, that you were going to be able to get to see the president uh, without an appointment? I had no idea. Uh, in fact, you did get to see the president without an appointment. We did. How much time did you have alone with the president? And I say alone, you had other people with you, but right. from his aides before the crowd came running? Uh, probably no more than 10 or 15 minutes. Was in that... In I bet Pat Cipollone set a new land speed record. I got a call either from Molly or Eric Hirschman that I need to get to the Oval Office. So that was the first point that I had recognized. Okay, there was nobody in there from the White House. Mark's gone. What's going on right now? I opened the door 
And I walked in. I saw General Flynn. I saw Sidney Powell sitting there. I was not happy to see the people who were in the Oval Office. Explain why. Well, again, I, I don't think they were providing. Well, first of all, the overstock person, I, I've never known never, never, never who this guy was. Actually, the first thing I did, I walked in, I looked at him, and I said, who are you? And he told me. I don't think, I don't think any of these people were providing the president with good advice. Uh, and so I, I, I didn't understand how they had gotten in. In the short period of time that you had with the president, did uh, uh, he seem receptive to the presentation that you were making? He was very interested in hearing particularly about the CISA finding and the terms of 13848 that apparently nobody else had bothered to inform him of. I was asking, I'd like you to claim that the Democrats were working with Hugo Chavez, Venezuelans, and whomever else. And at one point, uh, General Flynn took out a diagram that supposedly showed IP addresses all over the world and I speak, who, was, who was communicating with whom via the machines and some comment about like Nest thermostats being hooked up to the internet. So it's been reported that during this meeting, Ms. Powell talked about Dominion voting machines and made various election fraud claims that involve foreign countries such as Venezuela, Iran, and China. Is that accurate? That's true. Was the meeting tense? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, it was not a casual meeting. Explain. I mean, at times there were people shouting at each other, hurling insults at each other. Um, it wasn't just sort of people sitting around on a couch, like, chit-chatting. Do you recall whether he raised to Ms. Powell the fact that she and the campaign had lost all of the 60 cases that they had brought in litigation? Yes, he raised that. And what was the response? I don't remember what she said. I don't think it was a good response. Cipollone and Hirschman and uh, whoever the other guy was showed nothing but contempt and disdain uh, of the president. Yeah, the three of them were really sort of forcefully attacking me verbally. Yeah. <laughs> um, Eric, Derek, and we were pushing back and we were asking one simple question as a, as a general matter. Where is the evidence? So what response did you get when you asked Ms. Powell and her colleagues where the a variety of responses based on my current recollection, including, you know, I can't believe you would say something, like, you know, things like this, like, what do you mean where's the evidence? You should know, you know, and, but things like that, or you know, a disregard, I would say, a general disregard for the importance of actually backing up what you say with facts. And you know, then there was discussion of, well, you know, we don't have it now, but we will have it or whatever. I mean, if if it had been me sitting in his chair, I would have fired all of them that night and had them escorted out of the building. It's Deborah and I both challenged what she was saying, and she says, "Well, the judges are corrupt," and I was like, "Everyone." Every single case that you've done in the country you guys lost, every one of them is corrupt, even the ones we appointed. And I'm being nice. I was much more harsh to her. So one of the other things that's been reported that was said during this meeting was that President Trump told White House lawyers, Mr. Hirschman and Mr. Cipollone, that they weren't offering him any solutions, but Ms. Powell and others were so why not try uh, what Ms. Powell and others were proposing? Do you remember anything along those lines being said by President Trump? I do. That sounds right. I think that it got to the point where the screaming was completely, completely out there. I mean, you got people walk in. It was late at night. It had been a long day. And what they were proposing, I thought, was nuts. I'm going, to, I'm going to categorically describe it as you guys are not tough enough. Or maybe I put it another way. You're a bunch of pussies. Excuse the expression, but that, that's, I, 
I'm almost certain the word was used. Flynn screamed at me that I was a quitter and everything. He kept on standing up and turning around and screaming at me. And then at a certain point, I had it with him. So I yelled back. I had to come over or sit your effing ass back down. The president and the White House team went upstairs to the residence, but to the um, uh, public part of the residence, you know, the big the big parlor where you can have meetings in the conference room. Yellow oval. They call that the yellow oval? Yes, exactly. The yellow oval office. I always called it the upper. Um and I'm not exactly sure where the Sydney group went. I think maybe the Roosevelt room. And I stayed in the cabinet room, which is kind of cool. I really like that. All, my, all by myself. At the end of the day, we landed where we started the meeting, at least from a structural standpoint, which was Sydney Powell was fighting. Mike Flynn was fighting. They were looking for avenues that would enable that would result in President Trump remaining President Trump for a second term. The meeting finally ended after midnight. Here are text messages sent by Cassidy Hutchinson during and after the meeting. As you can see, Ms. Hutchinson reported that the meeting in the West Wing was unhinged the meeting finally broke up after midnight during the early morning of December 19. Cassidy Hutchinson captured the moment of Mark Meadows escorting Rudy Giuliani off the White House grounds to, quote, make sure he didn't wander back into the mansion. Certain accounts of this meeting indicate that President Trump actually granted Ms. Powell's security clearance and appointed her to a somewhat ill-defined position of special counsel. He asked Pat Cipollone if he had the authority to name me special counsel, and he said yes. And then he asked him if he had the authority to give me whatever security clearance I needed, and Pat Cipollone said yes. And then the president said, okay, you know, I'm naming her that, and I'm giving her security clearance. And then shortly before we left and it totally blew up, was when uh, Cipollone and or Hirschman and whoever the other young man was said you can name her whatever you want to name her and no one's going to pay any attention to it. How did he respond? How did the president respond to that? Uh, something like you see what I deal with, I deal with this all the time. Over the ensuing days, no further steps were taken to appoint Sidney Powell, but there is some ambiguity about what the president actually said and did during the meeting. Here is how Pat Cipollone described it. I don't know what her understanding of whether she had been appointed, what she had been appointed to. Okay. In my view, she hadn't been appointed to anything and ultimately wasn't appointed to anything because there had to be other steps taken. So that was my view when I left the meeting. But she may have a different view and others may have a different view and, and the president may have a different view. Were any steps taken, including the president himself telling her she'd been appointed? Again, I'm not going to get into what the president said in the meeting. Uh, you know, my recollection is you, you're not appointed even you're not appointed until till steps are taken to get the paperwork done. Get, and when I left the meeting, okay, the, I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not going to get into what the president said uh, or, or said he wanted. Mr. Um, Cipollone. When um, the matter continued to flare up over the next several days, was it your understanding that Sidney Powell was still seeking an appointment or that she was asserting that she had been appointed by the president at the December 18 meeting? You know, now that you mentioned it, probably both. You know, in, in terms of like, I think she was, de I think she may have been of the view that she had been appointed and was seeking to, you know, get, get that done and, um, and, and that she should be appointed. As you listen to these clips, remember that Ms. Powell, the person who President Trump tried to make special counsel, 
was ultimately sanctioned by a federal court and sued by Dominion Voting Systems for defamation. In her own defense to that lawsuit, Sidney Powell argued that, quote, no reasonable person would conclude that the statements were truly statements of fact. Not long after Sidney Powell, General Flynn, and Rudy Giuliani, Giuliani left the White House in the early hours of the morning, President Trump turned away from both his outside advisors' most outlandish and unworkable schemes and his White House counsel's advice to swallow hard and accept the reality of his loss. Instead, Donald Trump issued a tweet that would galvanize his followers, unleash a political firestorm, and change the course of our history as a country. Trump's purpose was to mobilize a crowd. And how do you mobilize a crowd in 2020? With millions of followers on Twitter, President Trump knew exactly how to do it. At 1.42 a.m. on December 19, 2020, shortly after the last participants left the unhinged meeting, Trump sent out the tweet with his explosive invitation. Trump repeated his big lie and claimed it was, quote, statistically impossible to have lost the 2020 election before calling for a big protest in D.C. on January 6th. Be there will be wild. Trump supporters responded immediately. Women for America First, a pro-Trump organizing group, had previously applied for a rally permit for January 22nd and 23rd in Washington, D.C., several days after Joe Biden was to be inaugurated. But in the hours after the tweet, they moved their permit to January 6th, two weeks before. This rescheduling created the rally where Trump would eventually speak. The next day, Ali Alexander, leader of the Stop the Steal organization and a key mobilizer of Trump supporters, registered wildprotest.com, named after Trump's tweet. Wildprotest.com provided comprehensive information about numerous newly organized protest events in Washington. It included event times, places, speakers, and details on transportation to Washington, D.C. Meanwhile, other key Trump supporters, including far-right media personalities, began promoting the wild protest on January 6th. It's Saturday, December 19th. The year is 2020. And one of the most historic events in American history has just taken place. President Trump, in the early morning hours today, tweeted that he wants the American people to march on Washington, D.C., on January 6, 2021. And now Donald Trump is calling on his supporters to descend on Washington, D.C., January 6th. He is now calling on we, the people, to take action and to show our numbers. We're going to only be saved by millions of Americans moving to Washington, occupying the entire area, if, if necessary, storming right into the Capitol. You know, there we, we know the rules of engagement. If you have enough people, you can push down any kind of a fence or a wall. This could be Trump's last stand. And it's a time when he has specifically called on his supporters to arrive in D.C. That's something that may actually be the big push Trump supporters need to say, this is it. It's now or never. You better understand something, son. You better understand something. Red wave, bitch. Red wave. This is going to be a red wedding going down January 6th. On that day, Trump says, show up for a protest. It's going to be wild. And based on what we've already seen from the previous events, I think Trump is absolutely correct. Motherfucker, you better look outside. <laughs> you better look out January 6th. Kick that fucking door open. Look down the street. There's going to be a million plus geeked up armed Americans. <laughs> the time for games is over. The time for action is now. Where were you when history called? Where were you when you and your children's destiny and future was on the line?
Five, get up close with heroes, villains, and other icons from pop culture. Where to find them? Right here in town. And it's an adventure in the sky. We check out Natural Bridge Cavern's Twisted Trail Sky Rail. Plus, summer fun at the public library. Kids can enjoy crafts, activities in the cool air conditioning. Celebrate San Antonio. Coming to you live from historic Market Square. This is SA Live. You are outside, you are staying cool out there today. Yes, indeed, with all this intense heat that we've been going through. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mike Osterhage. And I'm Fiona Gorostiza. All right, well, the newly opened Marriott San Antonio Airport is making its mark on San Antonio's culinary scene thanks to the creative vision of Chef Jay Rodriguez, the yes. new hotel's executive chef and beverage director. Yep, agave to tennis is what it's called. He joins us with a recipe from the new menu. Good afternoon, sir. All right, what are we making here? Because we got some smoking pans. Yeah, yeah so don't let that scare you, right? Mm -hmm. This is what we want. We're looking for hard sears on the Brussels sprouts, uh, Fiona's, which is what you'll be doing. Um, so we're gonna go with our bacon jam first. Okay. Mike, you can go ahead and go down with your potatoes. And um, these are taking the place of scallops, right? Right, so that's why we want to kind of mimic that scallop look on the outside. So okay. we'll do a hard sear on the potatoes, mm -hmm. let this bacon jam kind of just sizzle right here, and then we'll go in with our Brussels sprouts. Super quick dish. This is part of our shareables and our quick bites menu, which means, and again- And quick bites, no joke, right? How, yeah. how many minutes? So you're looking at like seven minutes. Uh, seven to nine minutes. Again, we're at Marriott Airport. We know you're in a rush to get to your plane, get to your meeting. Uh, we want to get you there as soon as possible. So we can go in with the Brussels sprouts. Mike's moving right along over there. Okay. So you can and just so, dump them all in. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> yes. Uh, so while these are going, what are some of the other dishes? Other dishes. Yeah. So again, this is um, some of our shareables, some of our signature dishes uh, over here. You have your stacked and packed enchiladas, um, beautiful blue corn tortilla masa that we make in house. Uh, smoked chicken that we smoke in house as well, and poblano crema with a pickled slaw. We also have our pickle bites. Uh, and again, that's done with the blue corn masa, uh, agave aioli, really good stuff there. Yeah. Can break, we? Yes, absolutely. Break, break, break. Try it. Yeah. I don't know if we can break it in know. half or not. Well, uh, here. It's probably yeah. easier to bite it. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Lady in the tramp, we'll do it that way. Oh my gosh, that is so good. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. So now oh, we can go with cashews, mm -hmm. and then we go with cranberries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, Mike, your dish is really quick. Again, part of the shareable menu, seven minutes, you're practically done. So you can uh, kind of put that roasted corn in the bowl. Okay. And you're, Fiona, you're literally practically done as well. So. And the other nice thing, um, with Turn off. having quick little bites like this, and right over there, you know, in between the 281's uh, San Pedro kind of corridor, you've got North Star Mall over there. You've got, right. um, you know, all the shopping going on. and. You know, how many times are you over there going, okay, where do I want to go for dinner? Where do I want to go for lunch? Right. Stop and grab something real quick, right? Right. And and just because we're an airport hotel restaurant, don't let that be deceiving. Um, our price points are extremely non-guest friendly. Uh, it's, you know, $12 for a appetizer, $9 for a beverage, or any of the tequila infusions that you see. So. Mm -hmm. um, and you do a brunch as well, right? Yes. And what's on the menu for brunch? So brunch is, so what we do for kind of it's our brunch, all you can eat breakfast. Uh, we have an action omelet station. Um, we have the usual fresh fruits, waffles, pancakes, all of that good stuff. And, and so you said putting the sear on here makes it kind of look like a seared, uh, seared scallop, right? Exactly. Okay, and then I use this on here, like yep. this, and I you go. You got it. Okay, what am I doing? And then you're gonna add this? some balsamic. And you guys are practically done. So there you go. Just it, however you want to design it. There you go. Oh, wow, that looks good. I know, right? Oh, my I goodness gracious, balsamic. that looks good. Okay. And okay. let's oh, try. Okay. Now, and of course, to wash everything down, there's happy cocktails. hour too, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so we are working on a great happy hour menu coming after summer. Thank you. Um, but what we do, we can't be Agave 210 without um, without the infusions, right? So, uh, Mike, you have a beverage there in your uh, shaker there. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to add ice to that. That is one of my favorites. That's the Texas Turtle. And ice is coming to you right you now. You would ice me up, and I'm going to continue eating here. Mm -hmm. So, 
So, here you go. We'll pass that along to Mike, okay. and then Mike can pass us his glass. Okay. And then Fiona, you're going to do a purple ballerina. Oh, done. So okay. this one is gonna, there we go. <laughs> follow, follow, right? Okay, um, all right. And so Fiona, this one right here is our infused uh, ballerina lavender tequila. Ooh. Very good for the summer. Uh, Mike, yours is the um, pecan tequila infusion that we do as well. And you have a lot of different infused tequilas, right? We do. Uh, and you guys are going to be lucky enough to take a, the wow. three infusions home with you as well. Oh wow. My oh my god. Oh, wow. Here, try that. Does that I'm say happy hour? I'm going to trade you. I'm going to uh, trade you. Happy hour, happy day. Mm -hmm. You know, this is our happy hour at one o'clock. <laughs> Oh, wow. I know, and this is insane. Oh, heavens, okay. heavens, heavens. All right. Okay. So, uh, when did you guys open? So, we've been open, well, grand opening uh -huh. was not too long ago. So, about five weeks ago, grand opening. We've been open for a while, kind of rolled from soft opening into grand opening. Uh, Mike, you had mentioned you had been out there for the mm -hmm. rodeo pageant. Uh, a renovated building. Everything is brand spanking you. And it used to be the Holiday Inn right used over to there, be the now Holiday taken Inn. over by the Marriott, right. and all brand spanking new, like you said, on the inside. So yes. Open seven days a week, lunch and seven dinner. Seven days a week, well, lunch and, and brunch too. So. Yep. From 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. Mm. All right. And then Thank you can get you a so nice much. little snack, quick and, mm -hmm. quick and good and tasty and all that. So, okay. Thank you very much, sir. All right. For, your <clears throat> for more information, of course, on Agave 210. Just head to our website, salive.com, and click on the As Seen on SA Live tab, or just scan that QR code on your screen. Okay, inside, mm -hmm. good food, mm -hmm. and how about uh, something, you know, just to kind of beat the heat, whatever it may be. So our question of the day is, where in the summertime do you like to go? What do you like to do inside where it's nice and comfortable? Again, for us, it's host the show. Yes. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. Host the show host the every day, peace. all year long, and <laughs> world, world peace. peace. <laughs> We worked on that one. So, how about you? Um, went down to the um, Van Gogh exhibit, that one that's that's you're kind of surrounded by the artwork. Very, very cool. It is in the air conditioning mm -hmm. right downtown, so you need to check that out with the that music. That immersive and Van yeah. Gogh. I and know really, really it was neat. really yeah. cool to just really just be in the art. Yep. Such a cool experience. So, how about you? movies. Yeah. Um, movies are always yeah. a great go-to. Library. We can Bowling talk about that a is later inside. Too. You know, I'll do anything. Let like us that. know. All right. Let us know at SLFK Sat on Facebook and Twitter. You may see our answer a little later in the show. Speaking of things to do inside, how about seeing some heroes and some villains right here in San Antonio? Yes, our Jen Tobias Stresky, also known as Wonder Woman, is out at the San Antonio <laughs> Museum, Museum of Art. And she checked out their latest exhibit, which is part of San Antonio Spurs legend Tony Parker's collection. It features life-size figures from pop culture. Yes, Wonder Woman, the Hulk, Iron Man, all of the favorites from Spurs legend Tony Parker. I'm excited to get the sneak peek and joining me now is Emily Neff, the Kelso Director for the San Antonio Museum of Art. And I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Thank you for being <laughs> here. It's, it's a great super show for you to be here. Now this is very exciting because Tony Parker essentially lets you borrow all of these. Tell me about this. That's right, our, our Spurs hero, Tony Parker, yes. <laughs> uh, we learned that he collected these popular culture figures from the Marvel Extended Universe. And we learned about it because our marketing firm, the PM Group, uh -huh. uh, also collects and they have a kind of friendly competition between one another. And so we learned of it, one thing led to another, to another and here we are. In, in the show. Obviously, he's a huge fan, right, of DC and Marvel comics. And behind us, uh, I know he has some favorites. You walk through this with him, you talk to him. Um, and so here, this one has a special story behind it, right? Well, this is this is the Hulkbuster. <laughs> and for those of you who are Iron Man um, fanatics, you'll know that this is Iron Suit number 44. And it's about 16 and a half to 17 feet tall. So no basketball player is this tall, um, <laughs> even so, and it's 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 one of his favorites. He has many favorites, but the the story behind it's personally meaningful to him because he actually put it together with.
with his family. Wow. And it's his family who got him started in collecting mm -hmm. because they said to him, Tony, you have everything. What can we possibly give you for Christmas or birthdays? Mm -hmm. And um, so they gave him a smaller statue of one of his favorite superhero superheroes. And that led into this so huge collection wow. supplemented by loans from the PM group as well. Ah, okay. And all of these that you see in the show are in his basketball court in his private home. And I was going to say, where does he keep all of these? I know. Like, you got the Black Panther. Well, you would need, I know, he's huge <laughs> as well. And you would need to have a basketball court in your home to accommodate <laughs> exactly. all of these. So it's almost like they become friends yes. for him. Yes. And I noticed there's three Captain Americas. Well, there are three Captain Americas because um, Tony Parker has uh, a couple of favorites, but certainly one of them is Captain America, so that you see two of the film version Captain Americas, but you also see on the far side the one that comes actually from the comics. Wow. And comics have been around for a very long time, and then you have the phenomenon of the super popular movies. Yes, and there's a lot going on, because this exhibit will be here until September 4th, but you have a few fun events happening in July, right? We have some great events that our wonderful education department has pulled together. One is on July 8th. It's a free movie and it's Lego Batman. Please come at 8.30, bring your blankets, sit outside. The one that I'm very excited about is on July 29th and it is called Choose Your Destiny and it is an interactive superhero experience and you travel through the permanent collection discovering the heroes and villains in the collection and if you answer a riddle incorrectly, kind of like a, a scavenger hunt, um, it may lead to your demise. Oh. So it is fun for people <laughs> of all ages, and then it will end with the Teenage uh, Mutant Ninja Turtles oh, screening fine. again out of doors. And they are here too, by the way. We couldn't give it all away. Wonder Woman's around the corner as well. Uh, again, there's a nice connection, though, with this exhibit and what else you have here, right? Well, this is one of the things we love about the show is that you learn that these heroes that we all grew up with actually have been around in one form or another in all cultures cultures across time. Yes. So you can go through our collection, you can discover Hercules of his superhuman strength, you can discover Ganesha from India, he's the one with the elephant head, also known for his superhuman strength, but also his um, sense of compassion. Yes. So it gives you a chance to explore um, and go around the world. We often say Sama is our passport to the world through art. Beautiful. Thank you, Emily. We have more to come. There's another nice piece with a fun, fun backstory. You got to stick around the second half to learn more about that and we'll send it back to you Mike and Fiona how Perfect. cool I mean right. have those like bigger than life superhero <laughs> thing because yes. we all grew up watching those cartoons yes. too, so, and the movies for more information on Tony Parker's heroes and villains exhibition at the San Antonio Museum of Art you know what to do head to our website salive.com and click on the as seen on SA live tab all right, when I say live continues with fun indoor activities kids can enjoy this summer at the library while staying out of the heat. Plus, we throw it back to the time Mike and I hit the Sky Trail at Natural Bridge Caverns.